For 20 years now, Web Bike World has been known for going out and testing products and telling the truth about them. When I heard about the Vata 7 X1 helmet and claims along the lines of 1.9 pounds for a medium, along with Snell ECE 2206 and FIM certification, I couldn't believe it. So I absolutely had to take a trip to Spokane, Washington to get hands on this helmet. Here's what I found. Hey, it's Web Bike World Jim here in Spokane, Washington at the headquarters for Vata 7, a new helmet company designing what should be the industry changing helmet. This right here is the X1. The specs on this helmet, just mind blowing. So let's start right there with the spec that attracts me the most which is the overall weight. Be warned, this is only a prototype of the helmet. And so it doesn't hit the actual specifications that they claim, as I found out with my trusty fish scale here, which uh, when I lift this up, you'll be able to see that it is somewhere between two and three pounds meaning it's not the 1.9 pounds claimed, but there's a good reason why. So if you look closely at these printed portions here on the vents, front and back, on all of this is 3D printed just as a mock-up prototype. And once they get the actual production one together, it'll be more this material as you see on my Arai DTX which weighs significantly less. And when you're trying to get from about two and a half pounds down to 1.9, every ounce counts. So that's kind of what I've determined is, unfortunately this isn't totally on par with the production helmet that you'll be getting if you buy one. The other thing is the visor is not the same. And this one kind of caught me by surprise when they they were talking about their visor. I missed the fact that they said it was going to be a photochromatic visor that comes with the production model. So auto darkening, auto tinting, which is absolutely my favorite kind of visor. So that is huge value because those, if from transitions, cost anywhere from about $150 to $200, depending which brand you're, you're buying. Brian from uh, Vata7 tells me, their photochromatic visor will be made by Pinlock. So that's something new for me. I've never came across a Pinlock auto tinting visor, but I guess I will on this one once I get my hands on the production model. Now I wanted to show you a couple of things about this that impressed me. Uh, one is the venting scheme they have going on here. So you got two at the bottom, two on the front, and I'm thinking that will be plenty of ventilation when combined with these huge scoops up top. Now I notice there aren't any open and closed switches on this one, but that very well might change again on the production model. The visor action itself, so again, these are printed hinge plates and hinges, unlike the production ones, which they tell me will be metal, kind of like what you find on AGVs. So the action will be different, but even on this one, the action's pretty darn good. So you can see this clip, which is a, like a racing world type of thing. It clips in real nice and just with a simple flick of your thumb opens and you get that all important defogging position. So the, what, what I call the barely cracked open. And from there, you next have a fixed position right about open one inch, three quarters of an inch, depending where you measure it. Also very nice, but then they move to what is an infinite position. The grip is maybe a little bit loose there, and I'll be looking on the production model for that to tighten up. Otherwise, the wind is just gonna slam it shut or blow it open. So that one's real tricky to nail. We'll see. The interior in this prototype is like a micro suede, and there's a nice cheek pocket here on the cheek pad that runs all around. Now this is a medium, 
and medium is the size that will be coming out first. So I tried this on double D chin strap closure. So that'll make a lot of people happy. But yeah, the fit on my round oval head is very good. The only position that I find where I, I have maybe a little bit of too much clearance is right at the back here. So right at the base of the skull and back where most helmets will have like a, like a cushion, let's call it, that just kind of grabs in behind your head. I, I'm pretty sure that will be there, although they haven't confirmed it, because in order to pass like a Snell or ECE um, roll-off test, you usually need that to slow the helmet down. You can also see these massive exhaust vents on the back. I guess I should have mentioned that with the venting. Those are huge. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this is like on the road. I, I had planned to road test this one while I was here, but since it's the prototype and it's, I'm finding too many differences between what would be the actual production model and the prototype, I decided to hold off. And this was just a find out mission at this point and to, to check, are they even close to this 1.9 pounds? And they are, they're close. This already is lighter than any other helmet I've worn. The Climb Creos Pro at three pounds is the lightest one that I've worn. Just uh, to show a comparison, let me rig up my Arai DTX here. I'll show you what it weighs, because it should be about 3.6 pounds. And this one even has the pack talk edge on it. So if I read this, it's four pounds, which makes sense. So that tells you this fish scale not only weighs fishes, but it weighs helmets pretty accurately. I'm even missing or passing by the most obvious aspect of this helmet, which is the LED lights all around. And one of the questions I had related to the, uh, the weight, I, I thought, well, how can you jam a battery pack, a receiver and LEDs into this helmet and still have it weigh nothing, essentially, lighter than any helmet on the market that's full face and safety certified. And so I found out some of the answers. Look at this. This is their printed circuit board for the LEDs used on it. And they, quite literally are paper thin. So that is what you've got on the sides here, the back all around. They're, they're essentially weightless. The battery pack is also like a, a lithium ion type that they don't weigh anything. And it'll have a, a 12 hour runtime continuous according to what they tell me, which is awesome. You, you should almost never have to charge it. The on off switch in the helmet is, let's see if I can, there it is, right there. And it is a USB-C type connector, which is nice because then you can't insert it wrong unlike the mini USB, the charging cable I mean. So if you hold, press and hold the button, that turns on the helmet, puts it into or off the helmet as I just did. So I'll press and hold it again. There we go. And it also is the multifunction button for pairing to your, your bike, etc. All right, so check it out right now. I've got the left turn signal going on this Harley Davidson in the background. And you can see the two LEDs front and rear flashing in sync. We had it with the Ducati earlier, but there's some sort of problem with maybe the flasher module or uh, system voltage on it that it was out of sync so that tells you right away that everything is being controlled from the motorcycle and this helmet module is nothing more than just a mirror if i have the brake lights actuated on the harley Go ahead, Brian. you can see they light up on the helmet as well and you can make these flash strobe or just go on solid this is the transmitter box that you mount in your motorcycle. And it's got these wires here. So you've got a keyed power, a ground, a right turn, a left turn, 
and break signal that all are fed into this magic box and it transmits to the receiver in the helmet. Very simple. They're working on an ideal way to connect these wires into your, your bike circuitry. I suggested a PosiTap system, which I use on my bike and think it's just the cat's meow. Okay, so how do you control the helmet? You also have this app from Vata7. And so you can change the settings on the helmet. So Brian squeezes the brake and I can show you right now it's in solid. If I hit flashing, it starts flashing when I hit the brake. And if I want to burst, I can change it there. I can also affect the brightness of the LEDs. So if you want to even stretch your battery life even further. You can do all of that. And the app seems to work good as long as it's connected to the helmet. Let's say you have both a driver and a passenger riding a bike together wearing these X1 helmets. You're going to want to customize which lights flash and which ones don't so that the passenger doesn't get blinded by the rear lights of the driver's helmet. So you can actually do that. You can turn off the rear lights of the driver's helmet and just have the passenger's lights flashing. One last comment about the eye port on this. The eye port's a very nice size. I can see perfectly out of it. The interesting thing that I'm sure some of you are picking up on watching this is that these LED blinkers in the front are, even with the visor closed, are still in behind it. And you can see the, the LED light transmitting along the edges here, right? Let me just open this to show it a little more. Yeah, you can definitely see the light transmission through the visor. But the weird thing is, when I close the visor and I look through it, I don't see the visor lighting up red. You don't notice it. What you do notice is the light reflecting off of surfaces in front of you though, which tells you that the projection of the light is really good. So I know lots of people were wondering about this. The, the last thing that really attracts me to this helmet, beyond the lightweight and the flashing lights, which I think will really help with visibility out on the road is the safety certifications that they're claiming. Nevada 7 has got some really good people involved with the company who have experience working with well-known motorcycle companies like LS2. And there are also some ex MotoGP racers involved. There's a nice mix of people in Europe and Asia and North America all working together. So the foundation is there for a really successful company from what I can tell. But I'm still waiting to hear how this helmet is going to pass ECE 2206, not just 2205, 2206, the latest one, Snell M2020D and M2020R and FIM. This would be unheard of in my mind in, in the helmet industry because those are the toughest standards. Some of them are seemingly, you know, opposed in what they're looking for in a helmet, like Snell and ECE. Although now with Snell M2020R, they're lining up a lot better. So I, I've asked them to supply me with some sort of, of evidence to suggest that they have met those guidelines. And, I'm, and as I said, I'm reserving judgment, final judgment on the helmet for a road test with the production model and safety certification evidence. All in all, I really like what I see. And I mean, I haven't even gotten started on the, the backpack or the, the tech pack as they call it, which has everything from, you know, a hydration bladder to keep you cool to uh, the ability to recharge your devices using these solar powered battery packs. I really like the thought put into this product and the concept in general is awesome. 
a good day for motorcycles. To satisfy my curiosity, I did take the X1 for a quick little test drive on the bike, but honestly, this is kind of like eating a cake that's only half baked. It's just not finished. So my experience really isn't worth talking about because everything's going to change. I can tell you this much though, this helmet, if it is in fact going to meet or exceed all the safety standards out there, is really good and a helmet I want to wear. Contrary to what the head of the Snell Memorial Foundation told me back in 2019. Ed Becker told me at that time, any helmet meeting all those standards would probably be unwearable.